All right, so in this episode of Mind Pump, we interview an individual not super well known at the moment, but he reached out to us a while ago. And, you know, we get a lot of people that reach out to us, want to get on the show, and nine out of 10 times, we turned them down. Um, but this guy's story intrigued us a little bit. Yeah, he's been on a couple of podcasts that are good friends of ours, both Rich Roll and Tom Bilyeu, and I thought he had a really good story too. Yeah, and so you know, I got on the phone with him um, before we did. You know, decided to have him on the show, and I talked to him, and um, his story was was compelling. I think a lot of you are going to relate to his experiences um, through fitness. This guy. Had a real rough childhood, um, eventually went to prison uh, for drugs, and fitness kind of turned his life around. Um, and he's a, very, he's a very vulnerable, honest individual. Um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed doing this interview. I think you'll like it as well. He also wrote three books, uh, the first one being From Felony to Fitness to Free. The second book was The Heart of Recovery, and his third book is Faith, Family, Fitness. So here we go. You you have an interesting story, Doug. I I know. I, how did you get in contact with us initially to get on the show? I think it was it you that contacted uh, our 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 was our our media team. I reached out to Doug actually on Instagram. Oh, I was just like, who would I pitch? Because what happened was when I got on Impact Theory, my buddy Clay, who um, has been listening to your guys' podcast for a while, he was like, you got, you should try to get on Mind Pump. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, I know. It's just. And then when I saw DeFranco go on, and he, I've been following him, I was like, wow, I should try to mm. just see. And I just and I looked at who you had on to see if it would like even be a fit because I was just like but and I saw you had had other guests besides just like you know seasoned trainers on here sure you know? sure so I saw like that you had other people on here that I was like hey you know it's like worth Doug show. did you my name's Doug that's my in yeah. yeah did you is it is it because you haven't been a trainer very long so you thought oh I want to I want to make sure I can provide value or yeah because I mean as far as like my I mean I know my stuff as a trainer but like as far as like exercise science and physiology and kinesiology like you know, I'm not the most seasoned person when it sure. comes to that. Oh, we ain't so. gonna fuck with you with that no, stuff. No, we're not oh. gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I said I was gonna fuck with you, <laughs> I, I like, would never do that with trainer stuff. Bro. That's not fair. That yeah, would be no. that would be bullying. I'm no, not that. Yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no. so uh, the tibial tuberosity. How did you? <laughs> 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 no, we're not gonna go. No. So, what it, typically what happens, and maybe the, the audience should know this, is typically we'll get we'll get a lot of requests to get on our podcast, and nine out of ten times we say no, and every once in a while it, it looks interesting enough for one of us, uh, usually me, to get on the phone with the person and just see if it would provide value for the audience or whatever. And your story uh, was interesting. It, it was a bit, it was an interesting story. I, I would like for you to kind of get into it a little bit and then we'll ask you questions, I guess, as we go along. Because it was an interesting story about the whole, your whole journey and, and why you're in fitness now in the first well, place. Well, you started doing drugs by the age of 14. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, my life was a, in shambles, man. I mean, I was battling all kinds of insecurities and um, doubts and anxiety and depression. And what did it for me was I wanted to figure out how I could escape myself in whatever way I could. And when I started smoking pot, I felt like that escape um, come to life. And I felt like it, it numbed whatever fears I had, any kind of, um, you know, insecurities that I had, had had about myself was like, wow, I can be myself and not worry about anything. And then one hit led to the next. And then, um, sh slowly but surely I developed a habit where I was doing it daily. And then as we know, like drugs aren't cheap. So when you're 14 years old, making, you know, $5 an hour washing dishes or doing whatever I was doing, I had to figure out a way to support my habits. So that was for me selling. And, um, I found a way to, to sell and, um, be able to smoke for free. And then, you know, it got to the point where through high school I was picked on. I was bullied a lot. I was often told like I had Down syndrome because I was quite a bit heavier than I am now. And it just made my insecurities and depression and my self-esteem so much worse that my addiction to the pot grew to the point where I couldn't even smoke to get high anymore. I mean, by the time I graduated high school, I was smoking like a quarter ounce of pot a day, just ripping bong hits. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and did you have any friends during this period that you could kind of work, you know, confide in or were you feeling lonely and just getting picked on? I mean, I had my, my, my group of friends, but I was always like the laughing stock, right? I was always like the scapegoat, the kid who got picked on out of oh, my group of friends. So, I mean, I had a friend or two I could confide in, but again, it was like, I was so unhappy with myself mm -hmm. that it didn't really matter because my, I grew up in a broken home. My parents are divorced and, you know, through that I developed all these insecurities and was playing the victim mentality. Mm. You know, it's just like, you know, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why are my parents divorced? Why am I getting picked on? 
You only child or you had siblings? I had siblings too, but we were all kind of in the thick of it. And I think at the end of the day, what happened was I was the oldest. So when they got divorced, I was five. And so I just happened to be the one who like saw a lot of the stuff happening because my brothers were all closer in age, but I was like the one who just started experimenting with shit really early. Mm. Did you live with your mom? Was it, did your dad come out of your life at this point? Were they both still pretty involved? I mean, they were both um, pretty involved. I mean, we split time. It was weird though, because they were constantly fighting for custody over, over us mm -hmm. as, as we grew up, which I'm sure happens obviously a lot with divorced families. And um, so they were both pretty involved. Um, I would say I, as the more I smoked, I didn't, my, my relationship with my parents got more strained because they were like, you know, why are you doing this? You're, you know, why are you smoking pot? Why are you doing this? Instead of looking at, you know, they, they looked at the fact that I was doing it versus like the why. I mean, I just had a lot of crap going on inside of me that I never wanted to deal with. Um, and as a teenager, it's, it's obviously hard. Um, and then when I graduated high school, I, uh, I started sm like snorting cocaine and that really, like I've had anxiety my whole life and anxiety and cocaine go about as well together as a kid trying to lose weight and eating pizza every day. It just doesn't work. Mm. And so- So I, it made you feel worse, but you kept doing it? I kept doing it because it was like this adrenaline rush and I was trying to fit in with everybody. I was trying to be that cool, that quote unquote cool kid, selling drugs, doing drugs. And I just kept doing it because- um, I didn't want to lose friends. I knew if I stopped, then I would lose friends. Because mm -hmm. you guys connected over the drugs. Yeah, that was like our that was like our common, you know, thing that we had going on together was that we would do drugs together, we'd party together, and we'd sell drugs. And it was almost like I was more addicted to that than anything else. Now, were you also using at this time any other substances to numb yourself? Food, for example. Um, I mean, yeah, I was, you know, kind of. I mean, it, it was just for me. I, I ate like crap, and I but I didn't really think of it like that. I, I just was like, that's what I, what I knew to eat was I would eat like a cheesesteak and pizza for lunch because I was stoned. That would be like the, the cool thing to do is we right. would all get food with our friends. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like, I'm like, oh, I'm so stressed. I'm going to eat. You weren't aware of it, but it no. was you had a bad diet along with it. You oh, know, yeah. Something that I didn't hear on any of your interviews, like not a lot of people really dove into uh, your childhood and your your parents and your brothers. and or your, You have all brothers? Is that what it is? All brothers. So what's your relationship like with both your parents and then your siblings today? So today it's much better than what it used to be. I mean, before, if you'd asked me like seven or eight years ago, if I had, if I, what my relationship was like, I would have told you a different story. My mom and I had a strained relationship most of while, while I was growing up because she really took it the hardest when I was going through all my stuff. And my dad, like, um, my dad was just really like, him and I never saw eye to eye. There was a lot of tension between us always. Um, and he's unfortunately got a problem um, with not telling the truth and he's never really come around to like you know say he's sorry or anything what do you mean by that explain that to me like he's what how did he lie to you growing up or or just saying that things would be done that weren't done saying he'd come to sporting events that weren't done saying mm -hmm. he would have money didn't have money and so this created a lot of insecurities and even today when i share my story and i'm like hey you know i was homeless i was on the streets like i didn't have a place to go he was like you weren't homeless and i'm like well, I was because you kicked me out of your house. So technically, like as much as I, I'm not blaming you, I'm just saying like I chose not to follow rules in your house. So therefore, I didn't have a place to go. And with him, is this because of the was this because of the drug use that he kicked you out? It was because of drug use. And it was also because like I didn't get along with my stepmom, and it got to a point where we had to I had to he had to choose between me and her, and he chose um, he chose her. And I, I mean, I wasn't the best kid growing up. I mean, I was a I was a menace. Um, but my dad just, I just never really felt like authentically loved, I guess. And even today he just has like, if I sit and have a conversation with him, like you never get the truth out of him as far as like what color shoes he's wearing. So it's just, the more I've grown, it's just been hard for me to really like put the time in um, to align with that. My mom and I have an awesome relationship now. I just walked her down the aisle at her wedding last week. Um, my brothers and I have definitely grown. Um, there was a time where I owed two of my brothers $10,000 because of money they had lent me for drugs. And I thought that relationship was forever going to be over. Um, you know, but now like it's so much better than what it used to be. Yeah. You, you pay him back? Yeah. Oh, good deal. Of course. Good deal. Okay, so um, take us to the, the the story that you told me when I talked to you over the phone. Um, how you got into fitness and how that now is what you do. Yeah, I mean, so my life really turned around on Cinco de Mayo of 2008 when I was riding around with a couple of my friends who could pick up some oxycotton. I mean, at this point. Um, after I got involved with cocaine, I had um, 
looked for anything else to numb the pain and that thing was oxycotton five milligram percocet turned into me putting three four hundred milligrams of oxy up my nose every single day in cinco de mayo 2008 um i we were in the car um i see these these lights behind me flashing it's the cops i had a busted headlight and i just felt like my heart sink into the pit of my stomach and i knew my life was over at that point like i literally thought fuck my life is over and I was scared. I started crying. Did, and why did you think that? Did you have drugs in the car? Or yeah, I mean, I, I had a half a pound of pot in my car, $2,000 in cash. And when they pulled me over, um, they, you know, they, they, they had me roll down the window. My friend in the back seat had an open container of alcohol, which I didn't know. The cop smelled it. He gave the cop a hard time. One thing led to the next. He searched my car, found the pot, found the, um, found the money, found a scale, threw me in the back of a cop car. And then my life, like, that's when I really, like, had that feeling that, like, I knew I was going to, I was either going to be dead or, or rot in jail because I, myself. How old are you right here? I'm 20. Well, you're not very bright. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, all those things you're driving around on at the same time. Yeah, it was, it was a very dumb decision. And then when the cops, the cops actually asked me if they could search my car. And I said, yes, to show you how bright I was. So <laughs> it's almost like you wanted to get caught or in trouble yeah it was weird um somebody outside rich roll actually when he was interviewing me he said the same thing he's like i feel like you wanted to get caught for some reason yeah i mean it just that's kind of like drug dealer 101 you don't drive around doing breaking the law like nine times in your vehicle when you got or you're already doing something illegal which is drug dealing you know so that's already bad enough and then to be doing like five other things in your vehicle that could get you caught is just like it's almost like you wanted to get in trouble yeah and i um ended up going to court a couple months later and um, I was, because I was charged with, when I got arrested, they charged me with a felony, intent to distribute marijuana. And um, when I got to to court, um, the judge, he, he was like, I have every reason to sentence you to jail right now. Right. And he was like, I'm sent, you know, he's like, I'm convicting you of the felony. He's like, I am going to sentence you to five years, um, suspend everything but 90 days. So I mean, I had to do the 90 day bit in jail. Um, five years probation, 200 hours community service, all kinds of drug classes and fines. But he's like, Doug, if you can put everything without messing up, I'll take the felony off your record. And um, at that point, like I said, I was 20 years old, but I didn't think I was going to live to see my 25th birthday. And I reported to jail about a week after my 21st birthday and detox cold turkey of Oxy because I had that. Ooh. Oh, wow. Ooh. For three weeks. Now, how bad was your Oxy? Uh, like how much were you doing? How bad was this addiction uh, at the, up until this point? Well, if you're already on oxy, you're already fucking. That's the highest level of opiate, like pretty much, other than like fucking heroin, right? So right. You're, you're doing basically pill formed heroin, and that's got to be the most. I mean, I've I've been addicted to Vicodin. I've talked to it about on the show, and you know, I think the the peak I got to was like ten. 10 Vicodin in a day, which was a nightmare to come off of. I can't imagine what it was like coming off of oxys. It's terrible, man. It felt like you're trying to crawl out of your own skin. It felt like you had the flu for like three weeks, like literally like three weeks. And um, it was awful. I mean, and then like, you know, you're like, you know, shit uncontrollable. You're puking, all that yeah. stuff. Because I was- Shakes. Shakes. Hot, I, cold sweats. Because I was doing like three, 400 milligrams. Like the day before, the day I went into jail, I literally snorted like three 80 milligram oxy pills Ugh. and then went right to jail. I was like, well- this is it, like bon voyage, right? Yeah. And then, and then, like, then I detox, and I'm like on my last week of detox, and I just gotten into this like common area because when you get into jail, they book you, and you're in like this, um, these pods, and they figure out where you're gonna like actually stay. And I get into my like where, my, where I'm actually gonna stay, and my soon to be cellmate was the dude who changed my life, was the guy who was like a more fit version of Brad Pitt from from Fight Club. Um, kind of looked like Sal a little bit too, you know. Mm -mm. That, wait, how can you look like Brad Pitt? And <laughs> <laughs> I'm that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. But he um, he was doing like all these push ups and pull ups and like climbing the rails. And now, jail. are you intimidated? Are you walking in? You see a buff dude in prison. You know all the stereotypes about. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. you know. I was really scared. I was honestly yeah. scared about that. Too. Yeah, were you like this dude's gonna try to have sex with me? Like I don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah. Like are these the thoughts that are going through your mind? Not with him, but I did have those thoughts. Like my, literally, like I thought I was going to get have raped, beat up. Cause I was always, I was like the goofy, you know, scared, uncoordinated kid. They like those guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said that real scary. Well, the judge said to me, he's like, if, if I see you in my freaking courtroom again, he was like, 
I'm sending you, you're going to be in a cell with Bubba and like the big, in the big, he house. actually said that. Yeah. Oh, and wow. he's like, you wouldn't what last more than 10 seconds. And I was like, ah, yeah, you're right. So when I was in jail, I was, I was scared and we just started, we played Scrabble. We were playing some Scrabble and, um, so he was cool to you right out the gate. He was super cool, which was like weird because I was like, totally like, opposite of what I thought was going to happen. Um, but he's like, what the fuck you doing in here, Holmes? And I was like, uh, I got busted with weed. He's like, weed. He's like, I'm like, what'd you do? And he's like, you don't ask people what they did in jail. Like, you know, that's like the thing. Like, you don't really? Have, you know, did you to. ever find out what he did? <laughs> yeah, he told me. He had like, it was just like a bunch of like burglaries and he had like for drugs, right? But he had like a hundred felonies on his record just from like getting caught from like. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. And it was, it was ironically, he had just done 10 years in PA and then was there for a detainer um, in the county I was in. And um, then he, I remember him looking at me and he was like, you're going to start working out with me when your detox is over. And I was like, what? Like I never formally really exercised. I had a couple sessions with a trainer back in the day. Like my dad forced me to when I was 12 because I was like overweight. And then I played football like, you know, one year before I decided that, you know, five, eight uncoordinated scared kid doesn't, be doesn't belong at offensive guard. Um, <laughs> you know, Target. Target. Really, really bad yeah. position for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I remember like one night I just finally decided to give it a try and remember getting down into a, now, how long was the detox process? Three weeks. So three weeks, you're puking, feeling like shit. Oh, man. Now, is he hammering you about working out at this point? Like, hey, man, as soon as you feel better, you're going to work out. Yeah, he just kept drilling me and drilling me and drilling me with it. And now, were you intimidated to start working out by oh, him? Oh, I was so scared. So you're like, I, I need to work out. because When you're in jail and you're going through the withdrawals, they don't do anything for you. You just have to, like, um, what happens? Well, what happened was I had a prescription of Suboxone okay. to take with me in there, but because... I mean, of course, again, my, the bright brightness of me, you can't take a narcotic with you in jail, so they wouldn't let me bring it in. I could have it when I got out, which did me no good. Um, and they gave me, like, stuff for tremors. They gave me stuff for sleep, but nothing, like, what well, nothing helped because I was so used to, like, yeah, just being, like, yeah. tranquilized. Yeah, they're right, like, here's right. some NyQuil. Like, yeah, you got to do <laughs> yeah. it, man. Wow. Okay, so so you're, you're coming out of the detox, and then you just – what made you decide I'm going to do what this guy says? Is it because I'm scared of him? Or is it because you're like, I need to do something or combination of the two? Um, I think it was just like him, just him just constantly being that guy who never quit on me. Even though like the first time he asked me, I said no. And he just kept going and going. And it was more like that unconditional love that I felt from him for some reason. Like I just. Interesting. It was weird. It was, it was like, cause I guess cause of my relationship with my dad. Um, it was like the first time I felt that somebody had really giving me unconditional like love like dude i'm gonna help you i'm gonna help you. you're gonna get oh, through so it was he was like looking that. out from you right yeah. from the beginning huh yeah and it was and then i saw him and i saw how like ripped he was and it was something i, I always wanted but i never had because like, i wanted abs i wanted arms i wanted this i wanted that but i never had it because i was so like f in my eyes like far off in the health world that there was like there's no freaking way it's gonna happen mm -hmm. i think a lot of people fall into that trap like i'm never gonna get there i'm never gonna get there but if you never start you're definitely never getting there so um I just knew I was like, you know what? Like, what do I have to lose? And then when I went to do a push up and I couldn't, I was shocked. Hmm. I was like, fuck. And I was like, dude, why can't I do a push up? He's like, because you're fucking fat. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and he was like, you're fat. And I'm like, I, I know, but he's like, well, but you're not nice about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> and I, and, I, and I, I was like, and at that moment, I was like, what the hell have I let myself come to? I can't even do a freaking push up. I can't do one for my knees. I could barely walk up and down the steps without like getting out of breath. I was like, man, I got to do something. And him, he was just like, I'm like, are you sure you're not, you're going to stay committed to me? Because I had like some trust issues, just some stuff with my family that I didn't, I thought he would like do it for a few days and then stop. And then I'd be like completely like deflated, you know? And, he was on me every day in there and like put me on a little meal plan, which is tough in there because like, how do you do a meal plan in prison? <laughs> yeah, what does that even look like? Yeah. Uh, can of tuna, slice of bread, no. yeah. skip the mashed potatoes, yeah. skip the mashed potatoes, skip like whatever pasta we got. Um, no bread, no like oodles and noodles. None of the common stuff on commissary. Like I wasn't allowed to get except for like, I think we had like two, yeah, we got packets of tuna. Um, but he was like, if I catch you cheating on your diet, he's like, I'm punching you in the stomach. <laughs> And Wait, I, was, I think we're we're stumbling upon a very effective and new <laughs> effective diet plan. Punishment you know fitness. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you eat the wrong yeah. thing, you get your ass kicked. Yeah. So you were intimidated into eating. Like You're like, fuck, I better do this because I'm going to get my ass kicked. Seriously. And wow. Then, <laughs> <laughs> well, because then, then, then there was like one night like later on where I cheated and I ate like a bowl of ramen noodles 
And he was like, all right, Doug, you're running three miles or I'm punching you. You take your pick. And I'm like, uh, uh, uh. I'm like, but you didn't catch me. Somebody else caught me. He's like, he's like, Doug, I swear to God. He's like, I'm going to break your ribs. And I was like, <laughs> oh, wow. oh, damn. Wow. Okay, so 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 what's it look like now? You're doing all this stuff. You're staying super consistent because you're scared. Right. <laughs> yeah, so like what ended up happening was after that one night I started, um, it motivated me to at least give it a shot. And I was like, what else do I have to lose in here? Like, And he, what really like changed, I think for me was how he had me shift my mindset of the victim to the victor mentality. Because obviously we were cellmates, so he was asking about my story and how I got there, and I was blaming everybody. I was blaming my parents. I was blaming my family. I was blaming my friends, blaming this, blaming that. Everybody else's fault. Right? Mm. And he was like, Doug, stop being a fucking bitch. And I was just like, what? Like He was like, you can be a man or you can be a bitch. And this is like a lesson that I still use today. Any, with anything I struggle with, man, bitch, man, bitch, what are you going to be? And it's like, you can be a man and take responsibility for your problems. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? It's up to you to make decisions to change. You got yourself here. I don't care how many people did you wrong. You're here because you're here. Or you can be a bitch like most people, cry in the corner, say, woe is me, and not take responsibility. And that for me was like, fuck, he's right. Did you? Was this the first time you ever felt empowered? Yeah, because I was like, wow, like I, I have the power to change. And I didn't really believe it, but I had to almost have that, like that fake faith, that blind faith, because I knew if I didn't believe it, I'd get nowhere. And I knew I just had to almost like not fake it till you make it. I don't know if that's the right word, but I literally had to like, force myself into it. And so I just took it day by day. I said that right, we can do one day at a time in the mornings. Um, I would either walk or run, um, depending on the day, like depending on like where I was at in my journey. So I, I started of course with just like walking laps and then they give you access to outside unlimited or is it, no, it's, this is all indoors and like this common area. You can like walk around like the tables and stuff inside of so like, you're literally just walking in circles inside. Yeah. We'd have a, I'd have a deck of cards and I would like literally like count how many laps with the deck do, of cards. With the deck of cards. And then that slowly turned into me running, like run, walk. So I would do that for about an hour. And then at night was like calisthenics. So like one night was like push-up day where I would do like, I don't know, it was like five sets of like three push -up. I was something like where we would work our way up to be, oh, my whole goal was to be able to do a set of 10 push-ups when I got out of jail. Wow. And so like one night we would work on um, like push where we would do like, you know, the pull-ups or push-ups and then like dips off the chairs mm. and, and stuff. And then like the next day would be like more conditioning with like, jumping jacks and like abs and so stuff. no access to any weights or nothing anything? yeah no oh, it's just like all body weight stuff. all body weight stuff and like and then like we would do like we would do some stuff where we'd fill up like water bags like and do like curls and stuff and like do like some shadow boxing hmm. um but it honestly taught me a lot that you really like i mean you can get a great workout with just your body weight like i mean i've even used like just if I'm like, if it's like snowing and I don't, I, don't, I can't get to the gym, I'll, I'll be like, all right, I'm gonna do 500 push ups, you know? Like, what's the workout culture like in prison? Cause I know that that's from what I've heard and read that there's a, there's a, there's a workout culture within there. Not everybody, but there's like a segment of people that that's, that's what, that's how they, so they spend their time. That's how they spend yeah. their time. That's how they rehab themselves, or that's just how they, they pass the time. Uh, was there a workout culture in there? Uh, not, I wouldn't say it's a culture. People definitely did some stuff. I mean, where I was at, there was no gym. So like people, you would see people doing different types of push-ups and sit-ups and ab work. But where I was at, like most people weren't working out, mm -hmm. which was kind of weird because they would all kind of, they all kind of cheered me on because they saw me who was like this degenerate who walked in when I first, like day one, there looked like a zombie, could barely like keep up with like even like my daily habits mm. of like making my bed and like making it to breakfast like that's the half pound mm. weed guy right? no, <laughs> no, nobody was harassing you as you first came yeah did in you have hey, did you have like a nickname? like any cat calls or did anything you, did you have like yeah. a shitty nickname uh no i mean not really i mean people like they just kind of felt felt sorry for me it's like this kid does not belong in jail like what's mm. he doing here hmm. and um it was cool. I mean, so you're like the Rudy of prison. They all wanted you. To do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, Rudy. no, it was. I was literally like the Rudy. They were all like cheering me on to make it because yeah. they, they were like, "There's no way this guy." Like, they probably looked at me like, "There's no way that guy's making it yeah. out of here." Like, <laughs> wow. Do you I'll, think most of them were drug offenders? If you had to guess, I mean, a lot, yeah, or a lot were using drugs that caused some sort of offense, whether it was a robbery or burglary. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, some obviously, there's a lot of assaults in there. Um, so there's a lot of like stuff in there for like traffic, like suspended license, suspended registration, stuff like that, where people like were just in there for just repeat like, offenses. Wow. Yeah. Mm. So it wasn't like all your murderers and rapists and all that. Fun um, stuff. There was like, there was a guy in there who had like an armed robbery charges. Like, I mean, he was facing like, I forget like 12 years or something, but 
you know, it depends on like your crimes. I think they organize you by your crime on where you mm. where you go. How now? How long? How much time did you end up spending in there doing this? Seventy two days. So my sentence was ninety days. I was backing up five years. If I made any mistakes, I would go back for five. But I got like good behavior, and then I got a job in there, like wiping down tables. That took time off my sentence too. Um, but I didn't want to leave when I left. I was like crying when I left jail. Oh wow! wow. Now why? Because I was leaving my cellmate. It was weird. It was like almost like I don't know if it was like a codependency thing or what, but I was like, how am I going to make it now like without Stockholm this guy? syndrome? Right? Yeah. Like how am I going to make it? Like with like I felt like my life was forever changed because of this dude like not giving up on me and like holding me to my feet to the, the fire. Irony. Well, the, ir- the irony. The irony of it all. It sounds like the first guy that ever kind of believed in you or or cared. Yeah. Sounds like you. Yeah, and I think. I just didn't want to let him down. So he was like, I was like, how am I going to repay? Because at the end, when I my mindset started to shift, I remember my dad and my brothers came to visit me like towards the tail end of my sentence. And my dad was always like a yeller. And we were in the visitor's room and he's like yelling at me. He's like, you're going to go to rehab. I'm like, fuck rehab. I found fitness. And he was like, you're going to rehab. And I'm like, dude, why? I was like, I'm in jail. Like, why are you yelling at? Like, what, how much worse can my life freaking get? Like, I'm in jail. Yeah. And I just remember, I remember hanging up the phone and this was like a big turning point, walking into my cell and looking at Eric and be like, let's fucking work out. And at that point, I learned to use my pain and turn it into motivation because I knew that I had all this stuff built inside of me that was just going to sit there. And I either had the choice to let it sit there and rot the fuck out of my body, or I could recycle it in positive ways because that energy just stays there. And unless you journal it out or get however you do it to get it out of your body, I believe you got to do it in a more positive way. And like, that's when I started like learning that like I can use all this stuff in a, in a healthier way. And it, it changed things for me. And when I, when I left, I told my son, I was like, how can I repay you? He's like, just don't fuck up and pay it forward. And he gave me a workout plan that I still have framed in my place. So I never forget where I came from. I bought like, as soon as I got out of jail, I bought like the encyclopedia of bodybuilding by Arnold. Oh yeah. And Good I read book. that. Yeah. <laughs> I read that like 17 times. Classic. And they started getting like muscle and fitness and men's health. I just stuff that I just knew like would help because I didn't know everything. I mean, he knew enough, but I didn't, I mean, I was so fresh in the game. I was just trying to figure out like how it even get started with everything. Did you, had, did you decide that you were going to work in fitness when you came out? No, I was literally because of my, the stipulations of parole and probation, you have to have a job within a certain amount of time. So I like literally, I didn't think I was going to be a trainer because I was just like, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know if that I was going to want to do that, mm-hmm. but I got a job at a liquor store. Ironically, like a few months later, it took me a few months to get a job. That sounds like a bad idea. <laughs> I mean, I think honestly, <laughs> it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. I mean, I never had a drinking problem. Um, for me, like, I, I mean, I still drink every once in a while now. Um, and I never have an issue with it, okay. but it was just more like why I'm drinking. It's like, I always say why if I'm, if I'm drinking because I'm, I'm socially out with a friend trying to have a good time or I'm wanted, uh, you know, out with my girlfriend or whatever it is versus like, oh, I'm super stressed. I'm just going to, you know, put yeah, down a bottle yourself. of wine. Yeah, put yeah. down a bottle of wine. Normally right? a good mm-hmm. sign you have a problem when you're drinking by yourself. <laughs> now, yeah. how hard was it, though, to get a job? That had, had well, to be was, difficult. It was really, I mean, I had quite the resume. Before I got into jail, I had 21 jobs by the time I was 21. Wow. Yeah, because I would like, I would work for a few weeks and then I'd quit because I was like, oh, I can make like $7 an hour, like, you know, drying cars or I can go sell like a pound oh, of pot. God. I dated a girl like that one time. Did you? Yeah, she, got, she skipped around from job to job all the time and kept telling me, she's like, well, this one pays me a dollar more. I'm just like, yeah. this is, f-. you know, some guy like me would get an inter- or get in a resume like that. I would tell you to kick rocks because right. I'm like, you're not committed to anybody. Yeah. Fucking 21 years, 21 years old, you've had 21 jobs. No, I know, I know it was horrible, right? And I was obviously, I was not proud of it. And then, so then I would always have to check a box. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? Yes. You know, yeah. mm. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, how many jobs do you have?" I'm like, "Oh, 21." They're like, "What's the la- longest you ever made?" I'm like, "Ah, like two months." They're like, "Oh, okay, mm-hmm. next." Yeah, and um, I, so I got this job at this liquor store, and I worked my ass off. I never, I never called out. I was always early. I always like stayed late. I worked my way up to being the assistant manager, and then it got to a point like after it was about, about I was there about a year. So this is probably 2000, 2009, because um, I got out of jail at, at the end of two thousand eight. I decided I was like, wow, like I had really started to to transform my body. I'd lost like 50 pounds at this point by working out, reading stuff from muscle and fitness, reading the, the stuff from Arnold, um, you know, change completely changing my, my nutrition to the point where I was now focusing more on eating like healthier foods, like all day, every day. And, um, decided that I wanted to help other people use fitness to change their lives. So I became, ended up wanting to become a trainer. Um, 
back in 2000, the end of 2010 was when I really like made the decision to do it. Well, and where did you go from there? Did you end up working for a gym? Yeah. So what ended up happening was I was still working at the liquor store because I swore to myself that I wasn't leaving without giving notice because I'd never done that before. And I found a job at this local wellness center called the Mac, the Maryland Athletic Club. And I remember like going in there, getting interviewed. And I was like, they, I was like, I sold them on the spot with just like how fitness saved my life. Oh, you told him your story. Well, I didn't tell him everything. Mm. I just told him how much weight I'd lost and all that. And then she was like, all right, you're high. Can you start like next week? I was like, yeah, but there's something you have to know. Like I'm a convicted felon. She was like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, I'm, and she's like, so she like asked me some more questions about what happened. I was like, listen, I'll pee in a cup every freaking day. I was like, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll never miss a day. I won't let you down. Just please just give me a chance. I was like, please. And after like a few weeks of them going to HR and talking to different people in the, in the club, I was given a chance. They gave me a chance. And I remember jumping up and down. I was living with my grandparents at the time. And um, I just felt like I could take that torch that Eric had given me and pass it on and help other people with the gifts I had been given about how to like internally change themselves from the inside out with fitness. And um, I became a trainer back in 2011. I got certified through the NSCA in April, 2011. And my first year as a trainer, I like, I broke all kinds of training records as far as revenue. Did you really? I was like the highest grossing trainer out of like 75 trainers in the whole company. Oh, that's hmm. cool. Yeah. And it, and it's not like, I don't say that to brag. I say it because I just knew that like I was on the right path. Mm-hmm. Like I literally like. You felt, pa- just was it the passion? Were you just talking yeah. about it all the time? You I could relate really, with people really well? Easily because I'd be like, they would be like, because most people, when they look at trainers, a lot of times they're like, oh, you've been fit your whole life or even this, even that, you know, that's like one of the stigmas. Hmm. And um, I would ask people, I would just ask people questions. I'd be like, you know, so like, what are you trying to do? And they're like, I want to lose weight. I'm like, oh, why do you want to lose weight? They're like, I want to feel better about myself. I'm like, well, why? And they're like, what's like, what are you feeling? They're like, oh, I feel like insecure. I look in the mirror. I was like, oh, I felt that way too. Like, and then I would just be able to like hook them like that and then talk to them and relate to them. And they'd be like, oh, like, really? And I'm like, yeah, you want me to, if you need any help reaching your goals, let me know. And I was really like passive about it. I wasn't aggressive. And most people just kind of liked, I was like this regular dude. And like, I wasn't like, anything special, but I just, I, I just went over the top of my clients. I really cared about them. I really wanted them to see results. I didn't tell them I didn't do anything that like, I didn't know how to do. And, um, I just got really passionate about training people and helping people. And I, I worked at the Mac for probably gosh, six years and was always like their top producing trainer. I mean, mm. and you know, I just, again, it just, I just knew I was on the right path. Cause it seemed easy for me. What's happening at this point with your family like what's your mom and dad saying why this is why you're getting back on track you're not doing drugs you're starting to kill it you're the top trainer i mean what are your siblings saying what are your mom what's your mom what's your relationship like during this time well there was always like oh i'll speak for my mom first i mean there was always a lot of distrust between my mom and i um because i got kicked out of her house on my 16th birthday because uh, I got bust, she busted me with some pot and this was right after i'd had a party when she was in the hospital so it was like our relationship was like tense and so you know then when i got arrested like she had this huge she didn't believe that i was going to change like because you know it's like that whole thing where i'm going to change i promise i promise and you don't you don't you don't it just creates this mistrust sure and um so even when i got out there was still like all right well just don't just make sure you don't mess up don't mess up are you clean are you clean like there was a lot like she still didn't really trust me and it didn't take until now when she's like that and you know you're on the right path, is that creating conflict between the two of you? Of course, yeah, because it's hard because inside I'm like, I am. I have no I have no you know, I have no cravings for drugs, I have no intention of doing anything. And then she's telling me that and it's like, all right, well, I mean, I'm changing. I'm, I'm like I'm like at first I was the polar opposite of what I am now, the most unhealthy kid you could think of. And now I'm like the healthiest kid, like, you know, like packing like chicken and broccoli with me when I'm traveling. And like I just felt like I couldn't win. And then I, I, over the years, I had to understand like where she was coming from and that there was only so much I could do on my end that I wasn't going to, con- only way to convince her that I had changed is for me to continue to get better and change. Do you remember when you had that realization? Do you remember when you transitioned from being the son who was kind of bitter and angry that your mom still felt this way about you to this like, okay, I get where she's coming from and, and owning that part? It was really like, honestly, like not to get like, spiritual but when i became a christian um back in 2014 i mean i wasn't always i mean over the years i I was less bitter towards my mom obviously but then when i when i became a christian it wasn't like for me like a big spiritual awakening it was more for me that i learned that all this stuff happened for a reason for me 
and that like I I was it was meant for me. I met I, I went through all this stuff for for a reason, like to be able to share my story and help other people. And I remember like when I first like gave my life as a Christian, I got on my knees and I cried um, because I just I just felt like that monkey came off my back and I called my mom and I just said, I was sorry. I don't know what it was, but I just said, I was sorry. I remember I was having lunch and just being able to finally like calmly talk to her, like as a son and being like, you know, mom, like I know I didn't handle things the best as a kid and I'm just really sorry. And she actually said the same thing to me mm. and that on our relationship, gosh, like exponentially changed after that. Cause we got really, we got real with each other. And, and for me, it, like a lot of the bitterness went away because it was like, you know, like me being bitter isn't going to make her love me anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to make her continue to love me more and trust me is by the way I carry myself. And that also goes back to the whole man versus bitch mentality. Like be a man, like, take responsibility. Like, you know, she may never, she may have never came around, but you guarantee yourself that she'll never come around if I act like a complete jackass. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, I had to really take ownership. And with my dad, I mean, my dad, um, he was always like, he was always more so proud of me too. Um, but again, we had like a, a very, like a different relationship because he just was, he had this like temper growing up was always like, just seemed like on edgy and angry. And, um, and it just came off in a way that was just like, just, it just really put a huge strain in us. And even when I got out of jail, he like took, he took credit for a lot of this stuff. He was just saying like a lot of stuff happened because of him. And like, he was like, I knew the judge. So that's why the felony mm -hmm. did this. And I was just like, dude, you, the reason like felony came on my record is because I did the work, like not because you knew it. And so I just, eventually the more work I did on myself, I, and more stuff I, like personal growth, you know, stuff I attended, I just had to learn to like, you know, kind of set some sort of boundary to make sure that like, it's not mm -hmm. like draining me. Right. Cause family can be tough sometimes. Right. What, uh, what characteristics and traits do you have of his? Of his, I mean, I think he's an anxious guy. I definitely have anxiety. Um, I think with him, too, he's he's kind of competitive. I mean, I'm pretty competitive. Not like not like to a not like to a fault. Um, but it's weird, like with me and him, that like <laughs> it's funny. I, I hate to say this, but I always said I wanted to be the complete opposite of him. Like whatever he did, like whether he was like a pathological liar. And me saying now that I don't want to, like, even if I, like, I don't, I can't lie because I'm like, if I lie, it means I'm being like him or like, he's got a really bad temper. I don't have a temper. Um, you know, and I think like, it's just like, like the thing that was really hard for me with him was just watching the way that somebody that I thought was supposed to be the guy that really like was the one who loved us most, like treat me in the way that he did. Um, whereas now, I mean, 10 years later or whatever, 15 years later, I've been able to set a boundary. We can have conversations, but it's just not the same as it typically would be between a, a father and a son. Yeah. yeah. Hey, do, have you had any any drug relapses since you, no. Since you stopped? No, none. You, That's great. Any feelings of wanting? No, none. It's weird. It was weird. Like the further away I got from people I was hanging out with, the habits, um, just changing my mindset. Like, like whenever I get stressed or anxious, which I still, I mean, I'm human, right? First thing is not like, um, mm, let's go smoke weed or let's go snort this. It's like, oh, who can I call? Where can I grab like a hike or run or go get a lift or whatever? I'm just, you know, whatever it is versus before it was like impulsively doing whatever I could to, to numb the pain right away. Has yeah. anybody, uh, has anybody ever accused you of replacing one addiction for another with exercise? Of course. Yeah. And you know, people were like, well, you're just addicted to exercise. And I'm like, well, I mean, Yes, I could see where people say that because I, I am pretty regimented with my workouts. But if I miss a week of exercise, it's like I'm not going to, I don't go crazy. You know, like I always take time off. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really work out for any more than like an hour at the gym. Um, I give myself some grace with the way I eat. So, I mean, for me, I, I think if somebody has an exercise addiction, is they can't go one day without it, they're in the gym for hours and hours and hours. Like their life depends on fitness, where fitness is now part of my life. It's not my mm -hmm. life; it's part of it. Yeah. Well, what you're telling me is, it sounds like you're you're doing it because you take you're 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 valuing yourself, which is a little different. I think if your insecurities were motivating you to work out, then that might be where the mm. pathology tends to come in. And this self confidence that you've been building, how has this? played out in terms of like a significant other and have you do you have a significant other right now yeah i have a girlfriend um so it's definitely you know helped me in that sort of that sort of sense because growing up like i never had any confidence with women my self-esteem was terrible 
Um, because I was always like, I, I could have been a model for Pillsbury. And I was always told by like kids, I looked like I had Down syndrome. So, you know, I think sometimes like we get this false sensehood of who we are based on the external voices, you know, that, that in, come inside of our heads and then we start to believe them. And that's the problem, right? Is we start to believe what people say to us, which now, I mean, I've gotten to the point where I don't. And so I just believed I was this fat, ugly kid my whole life. And then the more I worked on myself, the more fit and the more I worked out and, and, tra and transformed my body, you know, the more I, the more confidence I had and the more I realized like, I'm not that person. I do have, I am a good looking dude. I do have great characteristics. I am passionate. I am this, I am that. And it just really helped me like align with the right person I wanted in my life. Because for a while I was just chasing after whatever I could, you know, like I could, I'm like, wow, I'm good looking now. I'm like 6% body, whatever it is. I'm going to go out and try to find like the hottest girl possible. And all it did was end up in like, you know, misery because like, it was just like me just trying to like, shoot after the wrong things instead of really focusing on like finding someone that I really align with. How'd you meet your girlfriend now? On a podcast. What? How, what do you, <laughs> how, wait, did, did she have a podcast? She a podcast too? No, or? what happened was... <laughs> she heard your story? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, funny story was her, one of her best friends is a host of a podcast and this is like, um, it's probably, we've been dating now for about five months. Um, she was like, are you looking for love? And I was like, well, I mean, if it's the right person, like, and I, she's like, I got the, I got a girl who's like perfect for you. And, um, I was like, all right. So I kind of like, didn't really know what was going to happen after that. <laughs> and she ended up like just uh, connecting us on Instagram and we like, we hit it off like right away. Good old Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> sift through those DMs. <laughs> oh, yeah. You slid in the DMs. Is that what happened? <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> and, um, but yeah, we, we hit it off right away. And, and it's like, you know, my confidence now, like if I hadn't done what I've done all the work, I would never have confidence that I have now in a relationship. Mm. What's your uh, craziest drug moment? And you don't get to use the, the brain fart of driving around with a half a pound of weed and the scale. Craziest drug moment. Oh, my craziest drug moment is mm. probably, um, when, I mean, Crazy or funny? No, crazy. So I, I'll get, I mean, everybody I know that has been addicted to drugs or to, to the level that you were at has got like a story. And I'll give you any, one that I remember we were sharing pill addiction uh, with a, a friend of mine. And he, I remember I asked him, I said, you know, did, when did you really know that you had like a fucking problem? He's like, bro, Adam, I'll never forget this. He goes, I, I, I remember throwing 30 of the Percocets in my mouth and chewing them all up. And he goes, and then I swallowed it and my stomach rejected it and I vomited everywhere. And he goes, but that wasn't the moment that I know I realized that I had a major problem. He goes, when I scooped it up off the ground and put it back in my mouth was when I realized I had a fucking problem. So I know you got to have some shit like that. I, I mean, yeah, for me, I mean, when I really knew shit was bad was when I, when I literally hadn't taken a shit for a month. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> a month You're with no shit? a month? Like, uh, what, yeah, what day do you go? You must have had bad breath. Yeah, what day? <laughs> <laughs> I was walking around like Quasimodo. <laughs> you know, like. It's going all the way back. And, like, I literally remember um, having to take, like, an enema. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was so bad. And, like, obviously, I, I'm not going to get into details of what happened, but that was, like, one of the moments where I was like, shit. And then another one where I just did some, like, fucked up stuff where, I, like, I would tell my grandmother I needed money for rent. Mm. And she would give me like a thousand bucks or something. And then I would go and just get drugs. And I was just like, you know, you do it. And then like afterwards, you're like, man, like how much longer can I keep doing this? Mm. And um, I mean, those were a couple that come to mind. I mean, I was always like, the, like there was always times where like I would get really stoned and um, I would like fall asleep in a hammock. And my friends would like light firecrackers underneath the hammock. <laughs> and, I would, <laughs> and I would like fly out. <laughs> Speaking of friend, what, what guys will do that when you're not friend. on. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> what's your what's your theory uh, or what do, what do you believe about the importance of the circle of people you surround yourself with? I think it's so important. Like I always say the to surround yourself with people that challenge, love and support you unconditionally. And it's like you show me your friends, you know, show me your future. And um because I think for me, like say that again, show me your friends, show, say that again, show me your friends and like, I'll show you your future. Like literally uh, like, because you create this false sense of, you create like this, your environment can give you like this false sense of normalcy. Like if you think about a bunch of alcoholics who are in the bar, like seven, eight, nine AM, they're staying there all day. They're like, Oh, I don't have a problem. Everybody else is doing it. Well, everybody yeah. else in there is doing it. And then like for me, I thought what I was doing was normal. I thought doing drugs, selling drugs, doing all that was like normal because everybody I was hanging out with, was doing that too. It wasn't until I got outside of that that I realized like, hey, like whatever I'm doing, like it's not not right. 
And so now it's like, I only really surround myself with people that like add value to my life that are like lifting me up, you know, supporting me, calling me on my bullshit, like holding me accountable. And then we have common futures and not common past, you know, because I think a lot of times like we get caught up in, oh, I've known so-and-so for 10 years we were, that like, I can't like leave him or leave her or whatever, but it's like they're influencing or being around you to make every single bad decision you've ever made. So you really think that's important. Great Guys, point. it's so true that we we tend to do that, right? We tend to hang out with these people that we we had we had a similar bad past and so we connect. I remember when I first started to piece that together, how important like my my circle was. Now since you've put this all together, and I and I imagine you've already dealt with this, you know, what's a recent relationship that you've had to kind of carve off? And who was it and how hard was that for you? Um, I mean, there's been several, but I mean, I guess in the last few years, it was like one of my best friends growing up um, who got addicted to, to painkillers shortly after I did. And then when I got clean, he was still bouncing off and on, off and on. I'd always get the, the call from his mom, from his girlfriend or his aunt or whoever it was, you know, help so-and-so, help so-and-so. And I just... You know, I kept helping him and kept helping him. And then after a point in time, I was just like, dude, like, I can't help you anymore. Like, I can't keep enabling you. I can't. It's bringing me down. It's draining me. Like, you got to get help. And if you're not going to get help, I, I can't. It's just, it's, and it's hard because I don't, I don't want to like, I don't think he's a bad person. I'm just like, I can't keep you around in my circle unless you're like really wanting to make your life better. Yeah. Hmm. Where's he at today? Still, still in? I mean, the last I heard he's, I actually got a call from him a few months ago that he'd overdosed. He was in jail. Um, I think he's back out now. I mean, I try to like keep tabs of them on social media a little bit, but um, it's tough. I mean, because what happens is even like I've gotten rid of like all my old friends, like all my friends I hang out with now, I, I they're very, they're fairly new as in like I've known them some five years, six years, seven years. And I think a lot of people, I feel like thought I was judging them, but really I have no, I have no issue with any, anybody. It's just, I knew that when I was hanging out with that group of guys and if they're going to continue to make the same decisions, that it wasn't going to end good for me. And I had to think of, I had to think about myself and I thought about it. I always thought about pe people pleasing everybody when I was a kid trying to fit in. And I just knew that that just got me, it got me in jail and I just didn't want to do that anymore. You, you had mentioned, um, becoming a Christian, uh, back in 2014. Yeah. How how big of a role has a spiritual practice now that you have? Did you have a spiritual practice before? No, um, no, because I grew up like old. I was Greek. I'm Greek, so I grew up old school Greek Orthodox, where my view was: if you're good, you went to heaven; if you're bad, you went to hell. And I was like, well, shit, I'm on the highway to hell. Like, mm -hmm. there's no saving me. Were you a pra Did you practice? Were you a practicing? No. Okay, so you didn't really have a spiritual practice no. before. And it, it, what made you move into a spiritual practice later on? And then again, how big of a role did that play in? It was huge. I mean, I had a client who was a uh, pastor at a non-denominational church, and um, he was like, "You should go to church with me." I'm like, "Yeah, man." He's like, "We can go to Chipotle after." I'm like, "I don't eat Chipotle." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good selling point. Sure to bribe I you. mean, I'm in no. yeah. church in Chipotle. They have donuts yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he was like, "Quesadillas." Yeah. <laughs> he was like, "He's like, come on." I was like, "Dude, I don't belong in church." I was like, "I'm going to hell for putting you through this workout." He's like, "Come on, man. Come on, brother." You know, he's like this, like you know, he's like from North Carolina or whatever, and um. And I finally, like, I just got to a point, it was like in September of 2014, I was making a lot of money as a trainer. I was doing really well. I was fit. I was, um, I'd been clean. I just written my first book from Felony to Fitness to Free. And I, I thought I should be happier, right? I was like, why aren't I happy? And I think it was because I still had held onto that burden. Like we talked about earlier with my mom and, and just all, not just that, but every other bad decision I made was always sitting on my shoulder, whether it was the manipulating people to, to, to get money or selling drugs or doing drugs, whatever it was. And I remember just like, I was out in San Diego, I was at a ma like a mastermind retreat that I've been part of. And um, one of my mentors was like, dude, like you have no like spiritual purpose in your life. He's like, what's your purpose? Like, you have nothing. Like, he was like, I'm not like pushing you to do anything, but he's like, I don't know, maybe try that. Like he's like, it's been huge for me. And I was like, huh, he's telling me that, my client. So I was like, I'll just give it a try. So I remember calling my client, Ben. I was like, hey, I think I'm ready to try this Jesus thing. Even though, like, to me, like, <laughs> I, a, I hated. What a great phone call. I'll take it for a spin. <laughs> I hated. Yeah. Like, the Jesus freaks. I hated. Jesus I got, ride. I got so turned off by that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, like I said, when I gave my life to Jesus the, the day in his office, I just felt completely, like, I felt like, I felt like that same monkey come off my back that I felt like when I started smoking pot. I felt like I could be comfortable with who I was. And I really realized that there's no coincidence 
um, that Eric helped me in jail use fitness to change my life. And now I'm helping other people use fitness to change their lives. And um, for me, it's just about not being an asshole when I'm a Christian. It's like, just like every other religion or spiritual practice, it's like treat people with respect, you know, own your shit. Um, life's not all about me. Um, and just knowing like why things happen and, and it just gave me a sense of purpose. Like I knew I didn't want to just be a trainer. Like I didn't want to be the guy who's in the, the gym for like 40 years. Like I just wasn't going to be me. I knew I had something more special to share. And that's why I've been really passionate about sharing my story, writing books and just, just put myself out there because I knew like there was, there was meaning and purpose in that. Mm -hmm. Do you plan on having a family one day? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I really, um, I really want some kids. Um, I think I'm going to be a great dad. I mean, I've learned a lot about what to do, what not to do. And just like the whole like challenge of just like raising kids. I love a challenge. So there's like raising kids, especially in the society we live in now. Um, I think it's important. I think I've just learned a lot of lessons and gotten a lot of wisdom on, on some stuff like with, um, you know, like what's, what's, what make what really makes people truly happy and successful and what that looks like and just being able to, to kind of correlate that into my family is something I'd be really proud to do. When you think about that, what's like the, you know, in, in the relationship that you, you lack with your father, what would be a, a thing that you know that you would do differently with your son? Uh, I mean, like loving unconditionally, um, being very truthful. And if you say you're going to do something, doing it, sticking to your word. I mean, I think your word's everything. Obviously, there's times where it gets tough. I'm not talking about those times. Um, you know, and, and just treating him with respect and not like, I mean, because I, I felt I just felt like disrespected a lot when I was a kid. And um, and like not like, and more like just being able to to challenge and support my kid in a way that's like loving. And I don't mean like sugarcoating stuff. I just mean where the kid feels like he like loves you and not like that you're like this, trophy for him mm -hmm. so that's what I, I felt like i was a trophy because you know we were obviously there was a lot of fighting when we were kids over the child support and over custody and everything that kind of bled into to our family life and he always wanted me to be good at sports and i just wasn't good and i think that got into our relationships there was one time he would just scream at me from the sidelines when he was coaching scream and i remember one time just telling him like dude like i don't want you coaching me anymore like you're embarrassing like I'm like, I'm like nine years old or whatever I was. I was like, this isn't like the NBA. Okay. Like I'm not going to be the next MJ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm five, two and like two, like 150 pounds. And I can't jump more than two inches. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, how's your, uh, how's your business now? What do you, what do you do for work now? And are, are you pretty happy with your level of success? Yeah. I mean, obviously you can always be, I mean, things can always be better, but you know, I'm really happy with, with the way things have, tur have turned out. I mean, if, um, got a pretty solid training business back home. I've gotten more into the online space as far as doing some coaching online. I'm still trying to figure all that out. Um, you know, my third book came out earlier this year. Um, it's done really well. I think I've sold about f over 500 copies, which has been cool for me, especially since I didn't have a publisher. I didn't do like crazy amount of like advertising with it or whatever. Um, and then the one thing I'm really trying to build up is my speaking career. I mean, I just got done speaking to the Clemson Tigers and football team last week which was awesome that's cool it was super humbling yeah especially dude. for the unathletic guy yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> they didn't get my jokes either when i walked in there they were like because they're all like serious like alpha males you yeah. know and i was like they're like quarterback is like trevor lawrence is like one of the best in the country and um i'm like i wonder how i'm gonna like break the ice with these guys because they're all looking at like who's this guy like 170 was, like, coaches and staff and i'm like <laughs> My name's Doug Bobes. I'm a new walk on quarterback. And they all look, they all looked at me. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like they were always like, oh, I'm kidding. And then I went up oh, to no, like, we're going to lose. I went up to like, <laughs> <laughs> I went to my contact afterwards. I was like, did you get my joke? He said, yeah, but nobody else did. They thought you were serious. I was like, oh, I was wondering why no one laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so most nerve wracking moment you've had so far speaking and podcasting all that. What's been the hardest? Uh, definitely impact theory with Tom. Tom. W. Yeah, it was hard. I mean, because he's not a God believer. That's why. Well, that wasn't. He, he, <laughs> well, he gave me the he fucking gave, Tom. He gave, <laughs> he gave me the platform to share about it too, which was awesome. Right. Um, but he just he he just chat he chat. You never know, like you know what kind of questions people are going to ask. And he got like right in with like, okay, like what was your mind? How did your mindset have to shift from you being in jail to like being? I was like, you know, and. And then also I've just, I've been following, I've followed Tom for forever. So like just being able to sit in that same chair that I watched other people sit in for years. Takes balls. Takes balls, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, figuratively. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, 
and just, to, you know, he challenged me. I would say some stuff and he'd be like, eh, but well, I mean, because yeah, <laughs> I don't like that answer. He's like, I don't, yeah, he's like, I don't like it. He's like, what else you got? And, you know, it's like, he's like, would a 12 year old really believe that? And I'm like, cause I remember he asked me a question about bullying. He's like, I was like, well, I think if I was 12, like now, obviously it's like, you know, knowing that people, you know, the way they treat you isn't a reflection of you. It's a reflection of them. He's like, eh, I don't think a 12 year old is going to want it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he's right. You yeah. know, like, cause I'm thinking about now what I, but I'm like, when I was 12, I was like, when I was 12, like. There's no way I don't. I was like I don't really. You know, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. Well, you ever get back in contact with your cellmate, the guy that kind of started all this? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I did for a while. Um, I actually ended up working out with him a few times, which was awesome because I could keep up with him. I could do like his routine with him and not like be slacking behind. Because, I mean, when I was in jail, it, there, I could never keep up with him ever. And so when I got out, I kept on the journey and was got to the point where I could. Um, but then he kept falling back with some of his stuff. So mm. I just kind of. It really broke my heart um, because I saw him choose to save my life instead of saving his own. Mm -hmm. But like, I never forget where I came from um, as far as that. Like, I still, like I said, have the workout framed in my place. And it just what changed it for me was he was asking me for money. And I was just like, I can't give you money, man. I was like, I'll be here to support you emotionally, mentally, whatever. I was like, I just can't send you money. And um, I know he went back to jail and, um, and so it was. It was tough, but you know, if he can't, if he called me, I'd answer the phone. Man, that right. is tough. It's tough that the guy that pretty much turned everything around for you, like looking to you to get things, and you know that it's not for the best. It's in your best interest or his best interest for you not to give him the money and stuff like that. That must have been a hard situation. Yeah, because I'm a pretty emotional guy, and I get invested with people, and I'm like, like I put a lot of stock into relationships, like friendships, you know, romantic relationships, stuff with my clients. And so that like it, it crushed me because I felt I was just like man like well, what's gonna happen to me like I because that was like I mean the self sabotage initial thought right and I caught myself but I was like well if he's doing that like what the hell's gonna happen to me but I just knew it wasn't about me it was about him and like how can I learn from what he's done to not go back into jail um, because it's funny the other day I was in jail volunteering and mentoring these, some of these kids and it was just so surreal. I was the first time I'd ever returned on the other side of the fence since I went, since the day I went in, like in a cell. I was going to ask you if you, if you had plans to go and, and help people and, and yeah. so you have, I just start, I honestly just, I had my first day on Monday and oh, it, wow. Yeah. And it was cool because it's like, there's like five kids. They're all like 16, 17 years old. They like some of them have committed, you know, violent crimes. Some have, it's just, and it, just to be able to sit in there and just share wisdom with these kids it's really humbling and powerful at the same time. It is also kind of strange because you're seeing like the same doors like close behind you. There's no like, um, like super vid. It was weird because the guard was like, yo, my man looks like Mark Wahlberg. And I was like, real. I was like, really? And <laughs> 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 yeah. All excited. No. Yeah. Yeah. Really? No. Really? Stop. <laughs> the, the guy next to you. Go oh, on. Never mind. No, <laughs> well, it was funny because when I was in jail before, they saw, they thought I looked like Spence from the King of Queens. Okay. So, which was, wasn't a good, which was wasn't a good. So you got upgraded. <laughs> yeah, right. I got upgraded. That's great. There's a long there's a long tradition of uh, of fitness uh, professionals or whatever working with people in, in prison. Schwarzenegger did it. They they would go and, and talk to them about working out. Yeah, yeah they go pose for them and everything. And there was a big deal when a lot of jails would move their their weights. There was a big controversy around that because uh, psychologists talk about how much exercise can help rehab people. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's a bad idea to take? To, to, to take weights and, and exercise out of prisons? Yeah, I do. Hmm. I mean, I think it's, I mean, obviously there's, there's, there's pros and cons with everything. I mean, obviously it can cause fights and all that stuff, but like, as far as like what exercise does for you mentally and keeping like your sanity and like, I mean, there's, you can't replace, like you cannot replace that. Like it's hard. And especially like, I think exercise and nutrition are two of the most underutilized tools we have to battle drug addiction. Yeah. Because people, we always just want to give them a pill, give them a pill, do this, do that. But like, that only works for so much. But how about your health? Because a lot of times people aren't using drugs because they just want to use drugs. Yes, there's a certain percent of the population that has that gene. But there's a lot of people that are using drugs because they feel like shit about themselves or they're insecure. Or they don't know how to cope with stress in a healthy way. And so exercise, meditation, all these other health practices that are coming to the surface are great ways to replace um those unhealthy ones that people had before. And I think you just, you got to do that as a fa like foundation because health is wealth. Right. And I think like if physical health, your phys if you're physically healthy, it, it can improve your mental health, your spiritual health and your emotional health. You can be emotionally, spir spiritually and mentally healthy and not be physically healthy. <clears throat> right. So I just think it just trickles down and everything else. 
Now, you, the romantic relationship that you're in right now, you've been in for like five or six months. When was the last relationship that you had before that? I mean, relationships with me are, are fairly new because when I got out of jail, I was 21 and I, I had to rebuild my life. Like I, I knew I, if I tried to get involved with anybody, it was just not going to result in anything good because I, I had a lot of healing to do on my own. So I didn't do, I was scared to date anybody. So you, I mean, you're a pretty self-aware guy. You share your insecurities. What are some of the insecurities that you're having right now with being in a relationship for the first time really in almost forever? Um, I mean, I think the biggest and some of the biggest insecurities for me, um, are, am I, am I doing a good job? Because like, I mean, I, I grew up in a broken home and this is like, you know, this is all kind of new to me. So it's like, I've done a lot of like reading actually, like reading like books on like relationships and like intimacy to try to learn how to be like a better boyfriend. Um, because like, I'm like such a growth mindset that like, if I don't know something, like I'm going to try to like figure it out. And I guess time figures, you, you figure out stuff in time. So that, and then like, just also the fact that like, um, just in like how, like what's like, how to, how to progress everything. Like, where do you, like, where do you go from here? And, yeah. um, have you faced your first, like, I, I used to say that the things come in threes. So third, third month, six month, nine month, 12 month are, are big milestones in relationships. And have you, have you hit some of the first like challenges and what were they and how'd you get through them? I mean, I would say like, there's always going to be, I, I mean, at least from my understanding, like challenges in relationships. And I think, you know, it, for, for us, it's just more just getting to know each other more. And I think the more we get to know each other, the more like we understand like um, how we respond to certain situations and how we both like to communicate. And, um, you know, it's like, we're, we're really like good for each other. We're really aligned as far as like our values and our beliefs that we've like built like a solid foundation in that. Um, and then, so I think, um, that like really trumps everything as far as like we kind of like know and like each other for who we are, which really helps a lot. You guys haven't had a major fight yet? Nothing crazy. No, no, no. What was the last one? Any role playing? Yeah. <laughs> so mate. So Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa, guy. I'm just, I'm curious. <laughs> no. I'm just curious. No. <laughs> All right. no, no, no. You're the prison guard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, relieving the house, you know, old times. <laughs> yeah. Um, Great, great story, Doug. I, yeah. I I appreciate kind of what you're talking about and your um, honesty. I think and your you, honesty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I really do appreciate that a lot. I can feel that you feel like you, that you have your sense of purpose. I can feel that through talking to you. So that's how you got yourself on the show, and I think you did a good job. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I I appreciate you, man. Keep doing yep. what you're doing. Thank you. Thank yep. you. Thank right you. on, man.